Well, I have the great privilege of being in a room properly socially distanced from, with, with, from Leanne Brown. Hi, Al. Hey, Leanne. Thanks for making the trip to see us here at the Writer's House. My pleasure. It's good to see you. And my pal, Lainey Brown, unrelated to Leanne <laughs> Brown, spelled differently. Hello, Lainey. Hi. Glad to be here. We are here to talk about a poem by Leanne Brown, the aforementioned. It's called Pledge. Leanne, would you start us off by reading it, and then we'll talk about it. Sure. Pledge. I pledge allergy to the flail of the United States of Amigo and to the reputation for which it stands, one national park under godmother, indivisible with lice and kebab for allegiance. I pledge allegory to the flagellant of the United Statistic of Ammunition and to the reproduction for which it stands, one naughtiness under good, indivisible with lick and juvenile for anatomy. I pledge a lelomorph to the flagelliform of the United State of the Art of American English and to the repudiation for which it stands, one nationalism under go-getter, indivisible with library science and juvenile court for alleluia. On my hop, I will try to serve godmother my coup de grace and to live by the give and take scramble lawn. On my hoodlum, I will try to serve Goose, my coupon, and to live by the gladioli scrap heap laxative. On my honors of war, I will try to serve go-go dance, my country music, and to live by the gizmo scowl lawyer. Leanne, for the record, yes. you were doing a gesture with your right hand. What was that gesture? Well, the first gesture was on my heart. Right. And the second was... Like this, which is a clue to what the source text is. Do you want to tell us? The Girl Scout Promise. So tell us about the Girl Scout Promise, because <laughs> right. I think everybody's got the pledge in their head, but yeah. Girl Scout Promise, maybe not so much. I think I actually left one word out of the original <laughs> that needs to be corrected, but it's, it's on my honor. I will try to serve God, my country, and mankind, and to live by the Girl Scout law. So is the Girl Scout, what do we call this, oath? Uh, prom, a Girl, Girl Scout um, pledge. Pledge. Yeah. Is yeah. the pledge <laughs> in your ear, under your skin, you personally, the way that the Pledge of Allegiance is for so many people oh, in yeah. the U.S.? How so? Well, it, it was a brownie through a first-class scout. So the answer the is you were a Girl <laughs> oh, Scout. Oh, yeah. yeah, second grade through high school. Can you year. remember yeah. at what age, as precisely as you can, <laughs> you went from unironic repetition <laughs> of the pledge to ironic oh. eye rolling, oh my God, when I'm a poet, I'm going to do something with this? Well, it probably took a little while, but probably just high school, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Lainey, what about the Pledge of Allegiance? At what point do poets realize these are words whose semantic content has long been lost, and we can do something with that. Depends on the kid, but really young, I find, in this generation of kids. And it's also not as common as when Leanne and I were in school to actually do the Pledge of Allegiance. It's not, it's not uniformly pronounced or recited, I don't think, in the same way. Maybe you're saying that those watching this video... Um, of a certain generation would have this completely in their ear, mm -hmm. and others would need a little, I don't know, introduction to it. Mm -hmm. I would love for both of you to describe in, you can be very particular about grammatical, or you can just be sort of general. There's, there's rhythm, there's, um, in the Pledge of Allegiance, there's a ton of use of prepositional phrases that skitter scatter across so it becomes this weird periodic sentence talk about the sentence the grammar the syntax the tone the rhetoric it's a very particular and non-modern sentence who wants to start you're deferring to yeah. each other laney <laughs> huh. i'm thinking about well i have this question i'm wondering if this is the first Olympian poem that you ever wrote? Hmm. It's probably one of the first, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to explain oh. all that. You did dodge my question, which is good. I love that. We'll get back to it. Um, 
Ulipian means what? Ulipo. Now I need to excuse my French again, but it's like ouvrir, literature, potential, the workshop or sewing circle of potential literature, the French um, group of mathematicians and poets that's over 50 years ago started up and they're still going, where they made these formulas so everyone could write poetry. And there's hundreds of formulas. And they kind of claimed, you know, things like acrostics that already existed. But this one is a noun plus seven or sujet plus seven. This um, particular yeah, one that's is the a formula. noun plus seven, which we will explain in a second. Okay. But so Ulipo, in effect, takes super constraint in order to democratize, which is usually the reverse of what people assume about avant-gardism. Did I get that right, Lainey? That sounds right. So democratization how? Well, make the text visible in a new way. So if it's something that we recite rotely from childhood without questioning what it is, one a procedural operation transforms the text, then that becomes a tool for asking ourselves, well, what am I pledging and why am I pledging and what does what is a pledge? What does that mean? And to what do I want to pledge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it's like a little machine that um that you can give to anybody to make a poem, and that you only have to decide what the source text is and then what the dictionary is, and then you can just set it in motion. So it's the opposite of random chance. People think it looks random, but it's actually it's very set. It's it's predetermined in a way. People make yeah. the mistake of thinking of the large category of aleatory writing as a producing results unexpected as somehow um, open-ended and random. And of course, this is not. I mean, it produces unexpected results, but the process is already determined so that you two can do it. So N plus 7. I'm surprised. This, this Was this your first N plus 7? Um, I mean, published, uh, like... Yeah, it was a long time but ago. But you've, had, you've <laughs> yeah. always hung around with N plus 7 types. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is... This is early. early. I this mean, is like in Polyverse. I mean, I did some... What Emily year Dickinson. is Polyverse? What? Oh, that was 1989. 89. But it was... But a lot of Polyverse yeah. was published orally for many right. years before. So yeah. one reason this poem is so important to me is it's one of the first Olympian poems, probably the first encountered by a close peer... And it was a signature performance piece that was perf Leanne performed for years before Polyverse came out because Polyverse is like an accumulation of multiple books in one book. As we're, many of just Leanne's for the record, books. we're referring to Leanne Brown's Polyverse. Correct. So I, well, I was. It was a bit of a jibe, but N plus seven was all around you. It was the kind of thing that people you admired were doing. So I really want to push this mm. democratization thing because the reason it's relevant is those who pledge allegiance to the flag when this thing was really forced upon us through the 20th century and in the 50s, God was added, 1950s. So supposedly this is associated with the democracy, but N plus 7 is a democratization of an experimentalism. Mm, <laughs> I like to think about those two. Yeah. One democracy that we three take seriously, the other democracy we think got to a point where it was meaningless because people were reciting pledges without thinking about them. So I just said a kind of big thought thing. Would you respond to my big thought thing any way you like, either or both of you? Well, one thing I thought about is, I mean, you talk about the context, and I just want to tell a little story about it, is I was going to Naropa. Um, there was a lot of um, experimentalism going on there, and I Pretty sure I did this at the suggestion of Larry Fagan. And he, he's the one that said, why don't you just do it to the Pledge of Allegiance? So it really was, you know, he gave me that gift. Gave you a prompt. Yeah, but then I did the, the Girl Scout promise. I went on and did that. So that was like, I reminded me of, well, this other promise that I have made that Larry Fagan probably didn't know about, you know. So, and then after that, Bernadette Mayer added to her list of experiments, take a, a, a text like the Pledge of Allegiance and enact a noun plus seven on it. So she made an experiment describing the poem that I had been reading everywhere. So that was, um, you know, and Lainey thought it was like the experiment was on the list, and then I did the experiment, but actually I did the poem first, and then she added to the list. So this it's an interesting history of 
you know, generative experiments and descriptions of how to do something, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, I love that. In, in a minute, Lane, I'm going to ask you to explain for people who don't know it exactly how N plus 7 works, but let's stay on this for a second. So Bernadette, who is as close to, to use one of the words on this page, godmother, <laughs> as we can get, <laughs> um, for the two of you in particular, mm -hmm. does her list of experiments, which is an open-ended thing that gets added to and circulated for teaching, for children, for rookie poets, as, an insp as a, you can do it, you can do it, and you do something that Larry got you to do, and Bernadette liked it and added it to her thing. So the circularity, mutuality, intergenerationality of it all is part of the thing that we like so much. Does that make sense? And that's different from patriarchal and matriarchal pre-modern concepts of you inherit the canon of poems, and if you write into them, you've got to be the lesser, the newer, the younger, the imitator. And this is scrambling all of that. Can you say why, assume, on. assuming you like what I just said, the values yeah. of what I said, can you add to that? Yeah, I mean, it, I definitely felt that was a marker of the poets that I met in New York when I, after I came from college, and it, college was seemed more hierarchical compared to com, coming to be a young poet in New York. There was definitely a democ democratization of work and like people treating you as peers and that was like a revelation like they were interested in your work many of them not all of them but and and it, to, to me it seemed like some of the women were more <laughs> that way so um like Bernadette and Carly Harriman and different people I encountered through these these networks and actually another story about it that's sort of slightly tangential is that um cause, because I read this so much James Sherry actually s s said you should write that and write write it for, do a hundred permutations of it. That should be your first book. And I was like, no, I don't think so. It's, it is enough here, you know, that, mm -hmm. that that anybody can see what's happening and they can do their own. And I feel like um, that, that Polyverse and all my books really are, you know, it's like a, there's a real variety of work. And I, I see it as like a um, sort of like a gemstone of like possibility that people would see the poem and want to write their version of it. And I think that's one of the unifying imp impulses of my work is that I don't need to do 100 pages of it. I give it to you, and now you go do it. Mm. That's, I feel like that Im impulse is inherent in the work, and it's to do with, like, Bernadette Mayer's experiment list, where it's, it's generative, you know. Yeah. Lainey, would yeah. you respond to what Leanne just said? Because you were nodding like a bobblehead. <laughs> I'm thinking about that word generative, and that definitely seems like the atmosphere... That's how it felt walking around New York City in the East Village and at the time that we both lived there. I'm also thinking how I agree with what you're saying. It's true. And I also think the opposite is sometimes true. I'm thinking about your book, Sonic, Sonics, which is sonnets. So form dependent. You or any poet might choose to do one or 101 or 2021. We still haven't defined n plus seven, which we'll do in oh, yeah. a second. But I'm still I want to roll along because topically mm -hmm. this is getting very interesting. So to do the politics of this, particularly because of the pledge, but also because of the Girl Scouts, it's a very allegiant American institution. To read the politics of it, I believe that you have to feel or know the communitarianism that you guys were just describing, that mutuality, that you don't own a process, share it with others, see if they can get started, people making suggestions about what you can do with it. All that communitarianism, aesthetic communitarianism, surely has some relationship to how readers could read this poem, which is a satire, no matter how you shake it, of two institutional grammars, two very institutionalized sentences. Will you take me up on that and do, can you do a political reading that has to do with the very thing that liberated you into this, you can do it to generative stuff? Or am I pushing too hard? Well, I mean, there's, the the thing that I love most is because the, the words that come up and like the United States of Amigo, like friendship comes up and it's a Spanish word and the th right. it comes and it, it's, it's, 
brings to mind border crossings and, you know, um, intruding upon now, a very yeah. American and very yeah. English, American English line. Amigo yeah. gets in there is what you're saying. Yeah. And the whole thing, with, it just seems very timely. This was like written 20 years ago and it was, I saw the reproduction for which it stands and, and going with the United Statistics ammunition and thinking about the arms race and the reproductive rights and all of this is, is current as well now, you know, and it's, um, you know, just even the words like kebab and amigo, things about um, immigration are embedded in it. And there's all this thing about, you know, alleluia, um, the Christian <laughs> factor in the, in the elections. Um, you know, there's all this weird kind of, um, juvenile court stuff. Yeah. Juvenile court and the, and the lick and juvenile for anatomy that just sexuality comes out, you know, it's like this kind of, yeah, I got yeah, all of that. Yeah, like I was yeah, looking yeah. at the specific, <laughs> right word mm -hmm. substitutions uh -huh. so if you track um allegiance we have allergy allegory allelomorph and if you track um liberty and justice we have lice and kebab lick and juvenile library science and juvenile court so so it seems like yeah there's definitely um references to Sexuality is liberty. Education is liberty. Um, so what's cool about yeah. this is if I were an earnest, sincere poet trying to crit criticize the political culture of the United States, I might write a very, I'm not going to imitate this because it's rude, but there are poets who do this, a very sincere, it comes from my head, my imagination, I'm going to write about border crossing and immigration reform that's needed. I'm going to write about uh, too many guns. I'm going to write about reproductive rights. All these issues that are here, except these issues got here because... Mm -hmm. because of the constraint, and you didn't pick them, the dictionary did. Right. Which makes it that much more radical, yes? Yeah. Yes, say why. Yes. Just that playfulness that it's, that it's already there, and you have to see it in a new way, and you get it. Like, it's, it's already there in the world. And you, you know? didn't have yeah. to be a poet right. to dream up this issue. The dictionary, the, it's so ambient that the dictionary did it for you. I mean, it also reminds me a lot of Harriet Mullen's pieces about, um, you know, American English and, you know, the official language culture, like in, the, in California when they had the Spanish and English, you know, I'm going off at a tangent again, but, you know, this kind of um, thing about, you know, what is, what is the bibliomantic book we look at, you know, the Bible, the dictionary, like these things, and how do we use them and, like, read around in them as source text, you know, like there's a huge list poem of all these words, you know. Yeah. Lainey, tell us about, we should have done this at the beginning, but isn't this the way we run, the way we roll? <laughs> Absolutely. Here we are at the end of our discussion and asking you to go back to basics and tell us how N plus 7 works and how anyone watching this video could actually do it at home on their own. Yeah, it's fun and easy. Uh, take any source text, circle the nouns, N is for noun, go to the dictionary and count nine, no, seven, seven nouns down seven nouns down. and replace the noun with the noun you find now some poets will say adhere to the formula strictly but do they really do that do they see a noun that they like at nine i said nine eleven six and only mm. those of us who will know which dictionary they used will be able to check them right and you said like you use the word like I'm, I should go to seven, but along the way at five, I found one I like and I used it. Associative leaps and attraction to words. And some poets will go up and down in the dictionary, not necessarily seven down, but they'll just look all around or mm -hmm. make your own formula, you know, where you, okay, it has to be on the facing, two facing pages of the dictionary. Sometimes I'll do it that way. So Leanne, why should a skeptic not say, rather than more maturity of voice and poetic quality, this is actually a retreat into something juvenile and silly game. I presume you feel otherwise. <laughs> yeah. So how would you respond to someone who said, oh, you're going backwards, this is very silly? Well, playfulness is essential to poetry. I just feel like, you know, to play with language, you got to re 
relearn that if you've forgotten. You need to figure out how to do that again as like a child. But um, the thing I would say about the strictness and like choosing some other word beside it is I would recommend doing it strictly first. And you can take note of other words you love along the way, but I would, I would, cause it's, cause some of these things would not have happened five down, you know, if, if I had started to cheat, you know, some of these magical kind of playfulness spells would not have happened if I didn't do it strictly. So I, I recommend doing it strictly first. And the other thing I wanted to say too is, is the other club or thing I feel like I'm rebelling against in a way is, um, the Ulipo itself was very, you know, traditionally male, they did let a few women in later, and they, there's the groups doing things called like Nulipo, and there's, you know, a lot of um, work being done on that, and there's, you know, there's a lot of um, anthologies, and, you know, they're, they're, they're new ones, <laughs> yeah, but, but um, you know, I'm definitely not a member of the Ulipo, but, you know, I kind of wanted to be, but I think by writing this poem, I am <laughs> an Ulipian, you know, I, and I have a an idea we should do a book called Ulipo for Everybody, you know, Ulipo for Everyone, which they say it's democratic. They have they still have this hierarchical club, you know. So I think as long as we as we do the work, we're yeah. we're Ulipians. You know? So it's a third form yeah. of democratization, right. yeah. namely <laughs> to be part of a club that wouldn't have had you, right? Because you do what they prompt. I like that. Let's yeah. do final thoughts on this. Right. <laughs> this has been great. Are you were you surprised that we picked such an old poem to talk about? Oh, no, today? I love this poem. I. So it's an guess, encore poem for you sometimes at a sure. reading? Yeah, it's a hit. <laughs> it's a hit. Okay. Lainey, final thought? I just, I love this poem, and I've loved it across time, and it only gets better. <laughs> and when I read it now, I think of it also as an anti-capitalist poem. Oh, yeah. Leanne, final thought? Oh, I just love the part about... Um, to serve go-go dance, I think that's really yeah. great. And I mean, I, I was, I, sh I just remember being in a club in the East Village and, you know, doing a go-go dance as I did that line. And also like a, a rock guitar player, player, like doing his guitar and like doing the rhythms, like, da -da -da -da, I pledge allegiance to the flag and the United States of America. So there's been a lot of permutations of this poem in performance as well. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my final thought is just to remember the... Even as a kid, the repressive feeling I had when I was made forced to stand, I think I was forced also to put my hand over my heart, but I'm not sure if I was forced. I think I just did it. And recited the sentence that even, f even the first time made no sense because it's such a weird-ass sentence. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to do it, and you'll have to fix, fix, help me with it. But <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's either conjunctions or prepositions, a series of unfortunate slowings down of a very simple idea. Already it was troubled and it got passed off in my education as the most natural thing in the world. But yet it's the most contorted kind of English you could possibly speak. And so this does honor to the resistant feeling that every child had the first couple of times Great. and then lost. Thank you, Lainey Brown. Thank you, Thank you Leanne Brown. Thank you, Al and Lainey. Thank you. <laughs>